The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Sandra Balakumaran, a research scientist at uh, Virginia DOT. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the contributions from my co-authors, Richard Wires, uh, Professor Emeritus at Virginia Tech, and Michael Brown, uh, Senior Supervising Engineer at WSP. Um, I'm here to talk about the influence of concrete cracking on the time to corrosion initiation in the corrosion-resistant reinforcement. Uh, VDOT has been employing a, a number of crack control strategies, such as um, uh, using internal curing with lightweight aggregates, putting an upper limit on the cement content in the concrete mixes, uh, using shrinkage-reducing admixtures, and fiber-reinforced concrete for locations where you need to arrest the size of cracks. But none of these would exactly eliminate the cracks entirely. Uh, but they do help in control the, the occurrence of cracks. Uh, but uh, we realized that the, the idea behind these uh, concrete, uh, the, the crack control strategies, is that cracks would allow increased amount of chloride diffusion to happen and, and thus lead to um, significantly increased uh, corrosion at some point. Uh, so VDOT has also adopted uh, corrosion resistant reinforcement in concrete decks in the last decade. So we wanted to um, see the effectiveness of both these mechanisms. We want to see how the cracks affected the uh, corrosion initiation in the corrosion resistant reinforcement. Since we only have a, a little, um, I mean, short uh, amount of uh, experience with uh, the corrosion resistant reinforcement, we chose bridges with different types of reinforcement, but the concrete used has been uh, similar to what we use today. So we have uh, 27 bare bridge decks without any overlays, uh, selected from all the exposure zones, as we call them. They are selected, they are created based on the de-icing salt usage in Virginia. And we had bridges from all of these uh, six environmental zones. Out of the 27, 16 had uh, plain cement concrete, and 11 had uh, supplementary cementitious materials. Uh, the evaluations um, included the uh, crack survey, damage survey, and coring. Uh, the damage survey showed pretty much uh, no to really uh, low amount of damage, which includes the spalsed laminations and patches in all of these decks. Uh, in the field, crack widths were measured, and in the lab, the course we took from the uh, uh, field, uh, we measured the crack depths. In order to compare the, the influence of cracks on the chloride diffusion, we took companion course. Uh, we have one core from a crack location, and then right next to it, we take a core on a solid concrete. So we can do a one-on-one, -on -one, a one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, these are the crack survey results. I'm not going to go uh, over uh, the whole thing, but uh, the summary is uh, the longitudinal cracks seem to be uh, more prevalent in Virginia, uh, at least in the 27 bridge decks, compared to transverse and uh, diagonal cracks. And these are the concrete material properties for these uh, two groups. As expected, the decks with the SEM, the one on the right side, uh, they showed really low permeability. Uh, compared to the decks with plain cement concrete. And the pore space was also, as expected, uh, SCM concrete had um, significantly lower uh, pore uh, volume. But um, the concrete moisture saturation was uh, opposite. We had uh, significantly higher concrete moisture saturation in the supplementary cementitious uh, concrete. The reason might be because of the there are fewer pores to fill and the pores are probably smaller, so once the moisture gets inside, it's hard to get it out. And there could be difference in the distribution and the continuity in the, uh, the pore system as well. Here are uh, uh, two distributions for the two groups of bridges. 
The one on the top is the uh, uh, one with uh, plain concrete, and the one in the bottom with the supplementary cementitious materials. They they look pretty much like normal distributions, and the the cover depths are pretty much in the same range. And these are the distributions for the surface chloride concentrations, and they looked about uh, uh, gamma distributions, and um, they 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 were almost in the same range as well. And these are the uh, distributions for the diffusion coefficients. As we usually observe, these are some of the most um, variable factors. And we saw that um, uh, most of these were concentrated on the lower end, but still we had a really high spread as we, uh, as we see on the right side. So in order to compare the chloride diffusion uh, between cracked and uncracked, we did a pairwise statistical analysis using uh, Wilcoxon uh, signed rank test because these were not normally distributed. And um, the hypothesized value is actually the difference between cracked and uncracked uh, chloride diffusion values. Um, but uh, the actual values are shown on the, the third column. And the bold factors, uh, you know, the, the chloride at rebar depth, the diffusion coefficients, which is the rate of diffusion, and the moisture saturation were significantly higher at the cracked locations compared to the uncracked locations from this analysis. And these were all for the uh, decks with no ACM. And these are uh, the results for the exact same uh, analysis for the decks with SEM, And we found exactly the same results. Like uh, the, the chloride at rebar depth, the diffusion and moisture seems to be extreme, um, significantly higher at the crack locations. So this is first conclusion. Cracking does allow significantly more chloride to diffuse. Uh, not necessarily initiate corrosion right there because it's a probabilistic process, so um, the same amount of chloride at, at uh, one point may not be uh, considered to be a threshold value f for the other location, even in the same deck. And we wanted to see how the dimensions of the cracks themselves would uh, play a part in uh, causing the significant increase in the chloride diffusion. And we went through the literature, and there are numerous studies uh, which attempt to assign a threshold cro uh, crack width uh, above which there would be uh, significantly higher corrosion uh, to be expected. And these are our results. Uh, the, one, the plot on the left shows the, uh, the correlation between uh, crack width and the diffusion rates. As you could see, uh, it might be hard to um, uh, visualize this, but the, but the distribution on the, uh, for the y-axis for the crack width shows that it's not really a, a clear uh, relationship going on there. Uh, even for crack widths about 0.1 mm, we see significant uh, diffusion coefficients. But on the other hand, on the right side, we have the uh, correlation between the diffusion coefficients and then the crack depths. And as you can see on the uh, distributions, the histograms on the top and the bottom, they had much more correlation uh, than the surface crack widths. And we wanted to div uh, divide the data, uh, the crack width and crack depth ranges, uh, into ranges, so that we could see if there's any uh, statistical significance going on. Um, these are for the, the plain cement concrete, and the, the plots on the left, the summary is there's no statistical significance at different uh, crack width ranges. While for the crack depths on the right side, a statistical difference was found for uh, diffusion coefficients and the chlorides at rebar depth. And the same analysis was done on the um, SEM concrete, and uh, exactly the same results uh, were obtained, except the, um, the uh, chloride at rebar depth was significantly higher for the increased uh, crack depths, while the diffusion coefficients, even though it so, uh, seems like there's a pattern, uh, was not st statistical uh, significance there. So we wanted to see if there was any dependence between the crack widths and crack depths themselves. This is an independence plot. And as you could see, there is a small correlation going on. However, the results showed that uh, it was really weak. Uh, the R squared value was about uh, 0 0.06. So there's, there's not uh, enough uh, significance, a uh, significant correlation between crack widths and crack depths. So that's our second conclusion. We had the surface crack widths. Um, we found no significant correlation, while the crack depth seemed to have much better correlation with the chloride diffusion. 
And moving on to the service life uh, prediction, uh, this is a simplification of the uh, the, the life cycle of a, of a bridge deck. We have the chloride diffusion happening um, starting from the day of uh, the first deicing salt application. Once they accumulate uh, up to a threshold chloride value, corrosion initiates, and then once sufficient uh, corrosion byproducts accumulate inside, they um, once it uh, uh, exerts enough force to crack the concrete, you see cracks and spalls on the surface. And then once that happens, it's the, the propagation phase, as we call it. It depends on a lot of factors, and usually uh, it's a pretty uh, quick uh, process to the end of functional service life after that. So um, for service life modeling purposes, we divide these into three, three stages. The first stage is the time for corrosion initiation, which depends on the concrete material itself, the concrete cover depth, and then the type of reinforcement. And the second stage is the time for concrete to crack once the corrosion has initiated. And this depends on the concrete tensile strength and the reinforcement type, because different reinforcement types have different uh, byproducts. And uh, the last stage is the time for uh, end of functional service life, which is also called the propagation phase. Uh, a vast number of factors can uh, come into play, making this extremely hard to model. So we are only going to uh, look at the top of the, the first phase, the time for corrosion uh, initiation. Uh, this has been successfully, quite reliably modeled using fixed uh, second law of diffusion. And there are other methods as well. And this method is what we uh, chose. And we used a fully probabilistic uh, model developed at Virginia Tech. And the factors, the input parameters we need are the chloride at rebar depth, uh, the surface uh, chloride, uh, the diffusion coefficients, the age of concrete, and the concrete cover depth. And we also need to uh, use the chloride threshold at corrosion initiation, uh, which we have found to be uh, not just a single value, but more like a distribution. And we used a simple triangular distribution uh, based on our previous studies. And this um, is a simulated uh, model where we took all the uh, chloride diffusion parameters for these two groups and applied it for only those parameters only those factors we found on the uncracked surface, just the solid concrete. If the concrete never cracked, it seems the, the concrete with no ACM, the plain concrete, would uh, have corrosion initiation at about eight years. And for the supplementary cementitious materials, for the same uh, similar design, uh, the, uh, the time to corrosion initiation seemed to be uh, more than three times as much, uh, at about 28 years. In order to incorporate the cracking, uh, the influence of cracking in the service life design, we chose to, uh, rather than use, uh, do this bridge by bridge, since we didn't have enough parameters from uh, each one of those bridges, we combined them into different ranges. Uh, so we did this for nine different cases. We, uh, we uh, had three cases for the crack frequency, as we call them, the, the, like the amount of cracking, low, medium, and high. And then for each of those, we have different types of diffusion, because we found even with a few cracks, you could have higher amount of diffusion, or median amount of diffusion, or even low amount of diffusion, based on the dimensions of the cracks themselves. So we do have nine cases uh, in total. And these are the results uh, from the uh, service life uh, modeling. For, uh, and this is for the bare rebar. We did not uh, use um, uh, corrosion-resistant rebars yet. And as you can see, from the uncracked uh, situation, it gets worse as you go down. With, uh, with, uh, even with low frequency of cracking, when you have high diffusion, uh, high chloride diffusion through these cracks, you could have the corrosion initiation started within uh, six years for the, the plain cement concrete. And at the absolute worst case scenario at the, at the bottom, with high frequencies and high chloride diffusion, you have about five years. And while, when you look at the uh, supplementary cementitious materials, the, it performed really well when there are no cracks. But, but the cracks seem to be, um, the, I mean, the, the service life seems to be much more sensitive to the presence of cracks for the supplementary cementitious materials. And we think this could be because of the pore structure and the moisture, the significantly higher moisture, uh, moisture saturation in the deck itself. Uh, so the, for the, uh, the, the inference, is 
for a, for a deck with no supplement cementitious materials, it is porous enough uh, that the cracks don't seem to make a lot of difference. But when you have really good quality concrete, the cracks seem to make a difference in the time to corrosion initiation. And that's our third conclusion. And uh, VDOT has been, as I said before, uh, using a corrosion resistant reinforcement. We have three different classes. Uh, A1035, uh, we use the, the stainless clad on the second class, and the third class is the solid uh, stainless steel. And um, all, all we had to do is use uh, the chloride threshold values for these reinforcement types from literature. And uh, we see that there are different ranges and we use the, the lowest, uh, the most um, uh, conservative uh, values uh, for this modeling for the um, uh, 1035 bars. And for uh, A955, we found it's about 10.4 times as much as um, uh, bare reinforcement. And, and the results showed that uh, for stainless steel, it doesn't matter how much uh, the deck cracks, the corrosion did not initiate for uh, 150 years. However, uh, for, for the 1035, if there's enough cracking and then if there's enough higher uh, uh, adequate amount of uh, chloride diffusion, the corrosion initiation may, uh, initi uh, may happen at, um, at 30 years as well. So that's our final conclusion. We found um, that even though there, there's differences between the, uh, the corrosion resistant reinforcement, these perform uh, way better than the, uh, the bare reinforcement that uh, we used to uh, use before. And here are a list of um, uh, conclusions, as I showed before. And um, a, a detailed uh, information has been uh, published uh, as a report in the uh, VDOT uh, website. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.